Mr. Tolman, how are you? I think you on mute. Oh, let me see. Yeah. Oh, sorry, man. <laughs> okay. Hey, man, I'm doing good. It's good to see you again. Yes, yeah, sir. You too. So now, Mr. Tolman, Chuck Tolman, I know you are a historian. And for me, I, I'll preface this with, I know history is kind of seen as subjective. And I know for myself as a black person, a lot of times I don't trust history in America just because I believe it was mostly recorded by white people. So you kind of, you know, you rarely trust it, but I know there has to be a factual line, like people who recorded the real just because of their own passion for the facts. And I know you study the facts and from talking to you, I know you don't have a personal bias and you really try to get the real facts and you research and you get to the root and you tell it as you find it. And so that's why I wanted to talk to you. Now I hear a little feedback. Do you have a speaker that's playing back or, or is that my speaker? I don't have a speaker in here. Okay, so it's just coming from your computer. Let me see. I thought I heard it like bouncing back, but I don't hear it right now. So, so Chuck, let's start. I want, this is Women's History Month. And my, my birthday is March 8th, with, which is International Women's Day. <laughs> <laughs> and, yeah. And 95% of my audience on YouTube are women. Mm -hmm. and, and I would guesstimate, it doesn't break it down by race, but I would guesstimate maybe 70 to 80% are Black women. And so I wanted to talk to you about from a his, you know, historical perspective of take us back to when Africans were brought to America and the role of a woman in that. Like when we go back to the beginning, just tell me about that time when we were brought to America and then how, what was a woman's role in slavery? Okay, uh, so of course, you know, there were European settlements before Africans were brought. So the Spanish were down in Florida since 1500s, right? And so famously, they have the 1619 project, right? Or 1620 project. I can't remember what the number is, but uh, in about in 1620s, that's when they started importing African slaves in to do kind of other menial tasks. To take it back a little bit, um, Europe and Africa had kind of collided a few times throughout history. Uh, most notably in like the 600s, uh, the North Africans came into Spain and they took that area over. They were repulsed in France and they took over. And so they ran Spain for like about 700 years. And then they had what's called the Reconquista, uh, which ended in 1492, which everybody who studies any kind of history should know that's Columbus, right? So after they repelled everybody out, then they had to go looking for people to do labors and works. So the Portuguese had started sailing around and they found that they could actually the Romans, the Carthaginians, uh, you know, people in Morocco, they had all been trading technology. So there's a huge technological gap between this area of the world and Sub-Saharan Africa. So when these Portuguese come to Sub-Saharan Africa, which is like West Africa, Senegal, you know, Congo, you know, that, that area, right? The Ivory Coast, they find people that don't have these great ships. They don't have gunpowder. So they find that they have an advantage. So what they do is they start trading things. They, they pull off the coast and they say, we'll give you these guns, we need workers, okay? So in Europe, they had slavery. Um, it was called serfdom, there was other things. Around the world, they had slavery. So they were just trading. When they find this, this you know, new world over here, uh, they need people to work. They first try what's called the encomienda system. So they try to use the natives, but the natives don't, they don't last. They are not able 
to work that hard. They, they, you know, they die from overwork. And so they find that one, Africans are good at growing rice. They're used to it. So they start importing these people and they bring them over here. Now they start with just the men because the men were the laborers, right? You know, men have strong bodies. They're going to be doing all this work. They don't really consider, you know, taking women. But after a while, they realize that they need women, one, because now you can populate, right? So now you can kind of get more people. They're treating them like animals, right? You don't want to just have bulls. You want to have females so you can make more and more and more. And two, it sounds weird, but like companionship, right? If you have a, a family structure, you are less likely to try to run away and flee. Now you have to consider what's good for my family, right? So that's going to keep you rooted. Now, this, go, this runs counterintuitive to what we find out later with slavery, which is that they would sell people off and they would try to, you know, do all of this stuff. But at, at the time, it's like, OK, if you have a family here, you are less likely to create problems. Right. It, we're seeing it now in Ukraine. Right. So people are, you know, the men are having to stay and fight. You know, some of them are staying with their families. But, you know, if you have the families together, you're more likely to acquiesce. OK. So women are brought over for that role. Well, they're not brought over to do the hard manual labor. They're gonna do the indoor tasks. They're gonna start cooking. They're gonna clean up the people's houses. They're going to do like needlework and knitting and things like that. Uh, but eventually what happens when you get to the Southern colonies is that they have to do labor. They do hard labor because the men get seen as more valuable. Uh, so they get taught skills like masonry, um, you know, like, like kind of complex fishing things where they can make nets and things and go out there and do that. So that leaves the women to do all the, to do like all the kind of work on the plantation. Then they, you know, want to make fences. Well, they make the men go out there and chop the wood for the fence and the women are the ones sticking it in the ground and kind of compiling the fence. But what you get with this kind of weird, you know, amalgamation of all these different cultures, because when they pick up Africans, you look at it as Africans but they're not, you have to think of them as separate countries, right? There's a difference between a Spaniard and an Englishman, right? But, you know, the people from Ghana are different than the people from Namibia, the people from Senegal, they're all different, but they're forced to work together. And one thing that was very prevalent in Africa was that women, when, when they would work in their villages, the women would use the, like the hoe, they would like, you know, the men would clear the fields, they would chop down the trees, all that hard work, and the women would just kind of hoe the dirt and then plant the seeds. That was seen as woman's work. In fact, like a hoe is used in like, you know, like the garden hoe, it's, it's used in like symbology for women in some like areas. Well, here they made the men do that. And that was degrading to them. The, the plantation owners didn't care and they didn't know about this cultural thing, but it was seen as like woman's work. So the women were supposed to do the picking of the, of the you know, crops and the men were supposed to do kind of the manual labor. They didn't think women were able to do it. But over time, you start seeing, if you look at old pictures of people working like plantations and slaves, it's usually a lot of women out there. Those are the ones doing it because the men are out there like being rented off for the day sometimes to do manual labor. Um, when you go back and you look at a lot of documents, uh, you know, like if, if you were enslaved, you would basically be like kind of an employee or like a, like a tool or something. And so they would, they would say, hey, look, you need masonry, you're building your house. I will rent you my slaves for like a week to build your house. Now those, those people didn't get paid for that, but the plantation owner did. So he wanted to create more slaves. And so kind of the woman's role at that point was to maintain the community at home because the men were constantly gone. That's kind of what their role ended up being. And so was there a period where Black women from Africa had to do hard labor and did they have to take care of the kids? Always. In fact, they were given extra duties. The one time that they were kind of given light duty was while they were pregnant. So obviously, the you know the plantation owner didn't want to lose the, the baby. I mean, you know, like one, that's a human life. But two, that's an investment, right? Like that's that's another person, right? You know, you could sell them later or you could rent them out. So you didn't want them to lose that. You didn't want the woman to die in childbirth. You know, you know the kind of scene, sort of his baby factory type things, right? So. You, every two and a half years was what, like, there was a book that was written back, you know, back in those days, 1820s or so, that said, you know, you want to space them out about every two, two and a half years. That way you don't, like, hurt the woman, you know, that kind of thing. So you want to keep them away. You want to make sure that they're able to rear their child so that, you know, when a child's about two and a half years old, it wouldn't say take care of itself, 
but you know, you don't have to constantly watch a two and a half year old. I mean, you can keep them in an area, but you don't have to, you know, watch them as much as you do like a, you know, an infant. So they had to do everything on top of that. And plus, if they were working in the house, they had to take care of like the plantation owners kids and all the other kids because a plantation wasn't just, you know, a white family owning a bunch of black people. It was also all the like little white families that lived around that plantation that were hired hands. Or, you know, if I have a family, right, and I'm owning a plantation, you know, I might have my kids live next door to me, right? So they're all, we're all sharing the same farm. We're all helping out. Now you got to take care of all these kids. You're the babysitter, right? You're, you're, and, and that's why I think we see a lot of them get into education. It's, it's like a natural thing. It's like, you have to, you know, you, you are good at nurturing all of these children. In fact, the, the whole, it takes a village to raise a child thing. That's like an African proffer, right? So that's built into the culture. Right. So it's built into the culture of taking care of the kids. And they're naturally like, you know, wanting like a woman is naturally wanting to take care of children. They're not looking at a child going, forget about that. Right. You know, most men aren't either, but a woman wants to do that. So that's what they're given. So they have to do this manual labor. They got to pick crops or, or, you know, do fences. I mean, I don't know if you ever had to put a fence in the yard. I had to do it one time. That's hard work. Right. And so they got to dig the hole and put all the stuff in there. Right. It's, it's terrible stuff. They have to do that and watch everything else. Like, and on top of that, they got to cook and clean, make sure everything's done. So like they had the burden. It, like if you're looking at like the most burden, they've got. And that would be the black woman. Now, yeah. is, there, is there a woman in that time period that had a burden as heavy as the black woman? Like was, no. there, was there Hispanic women and white women and Asian women that had a burden as heavy as the black woman? No, not, not in that sense, because if you go into Asia, they are highly mistreated there, right? But they're seen more as kind of just like owned property of their husband. Um, they used to do something called foot binding. So like it was very uh, desirous for women, Asian women to have small feet in China. So they would break their toes and they would bend them in so they had small feet. That's like physical torture. But the amount of work that they're given, they're seen as dainty. They're, they're not seen as we're going to do any hard work. Now, when you get down into like, you know, Central and South America, the women did work, but it was kind of seen as shared labor. Plus they were not enslaved. They were growing up in their own culture. So, you know, everyone had to do their job. But here, I mean, black people were treated as beasts of burden, right? They were treated like no more than really than an ox. So, you know, you're gonna put all that work on that animal and then you're gonna expect them to act like a human afterwards. So, I mean, you know, not that there's a competition but there's really nobody that's like got that much they have to do on top of like living your normal life of just being a mom, making sure your kids grow up right, making sure that your community's done, you know, like, like together. And then on top of that, now you got to go do hard labor, not soft labor, like, hey, you know, you're like, we're reading or something. I'm talking about like, you know, break your hand stuff. I mean, that's why, you know, you get the blues out of the Delta, you know, that's why the, all the songs are talking about, you know, I'd be so happy when the sun goes down. Like, this is hard life. There's a reason that you had to have enslaved people do it. It's because people that weren't enslaved would quit after a while. They'd be like, this is too, this is too much. I don't want to do it, right? So, I mean, nobody's got it really harder than them. Like, they've really been kind of, you know, pressed upon by the society at that point. Now, what about the, the meals? Like, how did Black people eat and who prepared those meals? Did, did the slave owners... The, the, the white families prepare the meals and feed the blacks or did the blacks prepare their own meal and was it the man cooking or the woman cooking so um it, it, i'd say it varied by region right so in new orleans in like louisiana you have a much different kind of slave culture like they were a lot more kind of free in certain areas to do this but what i would say is this generally speaking um that you were allowed to kind of go fishing for your own food in fact it was encouraged right so there's like these old racist stereotypes of like black people fishing all the time. Well, that's because that's how they got their own food, right? You know, the plantation owner would provide, you know, rice and things for that. I mean, if you were growing it, say you were on a tobacco plantation, you didn't grow rice, they would trade. They made sure you had food and you'd have to grow it yourself. But of course people wanted flavor. So they'd grow peppers and they'd grow all of these other things. And, and, and interestingly like barbecue, right? Uh, it comes from this modern world, like the natives that were here, cooked on a, you know, a thing called a boucan or sometimes called a barbacoa, which is where we get our term barbecue. And they would use European style flavoring. So if you look at um, 
there's this guy who works at a um, I think somewhere in Williamsburg or, or somewhere at a plantation and he does reenactments. I think it's Mount Vernon. Yes. Where George Washington had his, and he does this great, like, like enslaved people's versions of barbecue. And it tastes different than ours because it's using European flavors. So the Europeans, the people that, you know, own the plantations liked mustard, like that came from Germany. Right. And they liked certain kinds of other things, tomatoes and other stuff that they were used to having, you know, vinegar, that stuff comes from there and they would mix in some of their stuff um like okra right you know like that's an african dish and so they would mix all of that in there but they would do mostly the cooking for themselves and that's why they had better flavored food right because they would save all the good flavored food for themselves really i mean that that's that's one of the sneaky things that they kind of would do for themselves so they would make sure that they had the most pepper that they had this and that because they would grow it themselves and they didn't have to share that necessarily because you were kind of allowed to have your own garden you were kind of allowed to grow your own food because then that's less of a burden on the whole plantation structure itself. So they were encouraged to do that and fry their own fish and do all that stuff. And their food was delicious. And, and we, that's why the white people eventually started saying, hey, let me taste that. That's great. Can you make that for me? That's why white people started liking gumbo and, you know, all of that stuff. Mm, so, so, it, so food kind of could have been a form of therapy. Yes. Food and music to me, just as a historian looking at this, were the really only two forms of like expression and freedom that black people really could have that white people encouraged and, and, and enjoyed, right? Was food and freedom. And you can look at that mirror today, right? You know, like white people like will go, like I'll go to New Orleans, I'll go look for the red beans and rice, right? You know, that kind of stuff. It's delicious, right? There's a reason that we're eating Popeye's chicken, we're eating good stuff, like eating delicious flavored food, right? And that's given to us by black people. And then music. Don't even have to explain that to you, right? You know, blues, jazz, hip hop, all of that stuff, right? That's your form of self-expression. There you go. And so, yeah, they're allowed to they're allowed to do it. They're encouraged to do it. And then people say, "This is great. Can you do that for me?" Sure, mm -hmm. I'll make you some, you know, some of this and that. And so they'd have they'd have barbecues where they'd kill like five or six hogs. They'd have all the other rich white people come in the area, and then they would, you know, proudly show off their enslaved guy who's a great cook, and then say, "I got this guy." And they would hire him out, right? And he'd go, oh, I'm having this dinner. You know, the man's not getting paid, but, you know, it's like, that's where it is. And that's how it spreads from one place to another. And then they get ideas and it all moves in. So now, do you think the men cooked or the women cooked or was it? Both. Okay. I would say it's almost like today. I mean, generally speaking, I haven't been to too many barbecues where a woman's doing the, like, you know, like the big right. kind of meat thing, right? Like I make brisket. My wife makes more of the daily dishes type thing, right? But like when it's a barbecue, it's like, that's a man's thing. You know, that you ever see commercials, it's always a guy holding that. That's, it goes back to there, right? The big stuff is a man's cooking. Like, but the women have to do the daily things. They do the side dishes, you know, they make the casserole and they make this and that, um, you know, it, but men did their own cooking especially because a lot of times you'd have those like forage parties or stuff where they would go out hunting. They might go for like a week at time. Like you take like 15, 20 men off the plantation and y'all might go hunting, you know, with the white men, you know, and the white men might shoot the stuff, but the black men might, you know, clean deer and stuff, or the black men might go hunting depending on certain areas. In some places they, they, you know, gave their slaves, you know, weapons, you know, if they trusted them and, and those kinds of things, but you know, they would have to cook their own food, kind of like, woodsman cooking they you know they're not making like really nice meals but gumbo usually is like a woman's thing right and it's always always somebody's grandmother made great gumbo and then the man you know this grandson might take it and do something with it but i mean that's the same in, in most societies right like the women are doing the daily cooking now question for me how, how is my internet on your now we missed a small part in the very beginning because i was trying to switch my internet oh it was at the very beginning when you were talking about coming over from africa <laughs> but how is my internet on your side am i glitching or is it no okay okay am i and, good um you you perfect you perfect my screen a little fuzzy just because my internet is terrible we, we're getting it switched over but it was so being that this is women's history month and i saw it on my calendar so that's what made me text you i knew it was like you know women's month but i didn't really realize that the whole month was like first day of women's history month is today and so in that line so we have black women in america they are doing hard labor they cook 
as well. They take care of their kids. They're having kids. They're taking care of their kids. They are also taking care of some of the white kids. And now where does like their sex burden come in? Like what was a, a woman's role of like how many kids did she have on average? And then also there started to become biracial kids. So black women, you know, sleeping with the white men. And I want to know about what does history say about that? Were, were, were black women also used for sex? Was it pleasurable type thing? Or, and where did the white men come in? Was that just something just being greedy and saying, hey, I've been watching this, you know, booty bent over out there all day. Like, where did this start to happen? All right, <laughs> so we got to go pretty deep into this. So first, we'll just start off with the fact that they are women, right? Not just black women, but they are women. And traditionally, women have been seen as objects. No, no, I mean, no one should be shocked by this, right? So they have that burden of just being treated as objects by anybody. And you got rape, you got kind of coercion. I mean, and then you've got like, you know, legitimate, you know, times when people fall in love with each other, right? And, and so it's really kind of impossible, if I'm being an honest historian, right, and not just doing some headline stuff, it's, all, it's impossible to say in every single case that, you know, this person was raped and this was legitimate and this, because it just depends on the people, right? You know, a boss could have an affair with his secretary and you could question that. You could say, well, maybe the secretary loved the boss. Maybe they did genuinely like each other. Maybe they were just, you know, like lustful, right? Or maybe she felt obligated to do that. Or maybe it was a mixture. Like you can't, when it deals with the whys of history, a historian can't really say. But what I can say is this. Um, they weren't treated exactly as like sex robots, right? Like you must mate with these people. The, the idea that they were like, like purposefully put together, like get this big slave and this one and mate, like that's, that's not true. They were, you have to understand that even though slavery was terrible, they were still trying to, work within a framework of Christianity, right? So they would still have marriages, right? Even though they would be sold, they would still like, you know, if you were a sold slave, you still had a wife and kids somewhere else. Now you still are human beings, so you might sleep around. In the plantation, people might sleep around. That might lead to conflict, you know, like things like that would happen. Sometimes, like in New Orleans, I'm doing a book now on New Orleans history, you, uh, there was a lot of like, the slaves were kind of free in the city to kind of go and come as they please. And sometimes you'd have fights over the same women, right? You know, and going into bars and stuff. So things weren't necessarily different. The one thing you need to understand when it comes to history is human beings have not changed in a million years. We still are basically the same kinds of people, right? We see a beautiful person, we want that person, right? You know, we fall in love, all of those things. People didn't really act that much differently. Even behind the scenes, they would still get it. Now, as far as like the plantation owner with like the slave kind of thing, you could just have outright rape. I mean, I'm sure that happened maybe the majority of the time. I don't know because I wasn't there, but I mean, you might have some instances where you guys say, man, this woman is beautiful, right? Like he married some rich woman. She's maybe ugly or maybe she's had a bunch of kids or something and he's fallen out of love and he finds this young, beautiful woman and she's black, right? And she's working in the you know, fields and he's just like, I want that, you know, just as a man, not like as a slave owner, but just like, hey, that's a beautiful woman. I want to have sex with her, right? Like that's just as a man, you know, it goes through your head. You're like, hey, I want to have sex with that woman. Like, right. And does she want to have sex? with him? I don't know. I mean, you know, you got you got girls right now in the club chasing clout, looking for money and stuff like that. I mean, to me, you know, you're getting a status symbol because now you got within your own community. Now, within the white community, you are still a slave. But within your own community, you know, say you got like a half white baby, you're going to be treated a little bit different. Right. That light skinned kid is going to be treated a little bit different. That's his son. Sometimes. Not always, but sometimes they would treat the kid nicely. You know, they would say, hey, that's my kid. Give him a little something extra. You know, I don't want him to die. Sometimes they would, they, you know, I've, I've read a couple of diaries where they were talking about, you know, and then the slave owner had a son and then the son died of cholera and it was like a half slave and they were torn up over it. And their white wife was like furious. Not only did he have a slave, but like they didn't care because that's not even the real kid. But to him, that's his, you know, like, you know, as a father, like that's my, that's my kid, right? So Every human being was different. The important thing when we're learning history is to not just generalize into all of this and all of that. Every human being was different. So what I would say is, yeah, there's a lot of pressure if you're a black woman to kind of acquiesce. But I would say it's, it's 
the same pressure as a woman has you know, in modern day. You know, if somebody of a of a higher position or something wants to get with you, you know, you can say no. But if you're if you get your boss at your job, you know, of course, the right thing to do is say no. And now that we had the Me Too movement, now you can vocalize it. Right. We've come a long way. But I mean, think back like 20 years, like, you know, you have to make a decision because they can destroy your life. And back then they could really do it. They could sell you away. So are you being coerced? Do you really love this man? Do you want the clout? Do you want the power? Do you want to just not be bothered? Like, you know, so you can't really say, but those things happen and they happened often. I mean, that's why there's such a light-skinned population, you know, in, in, the, in the country. When you go to certain Caribbean countries, they don't have much of a light-skinned population. It's because they had mostly like white families, like in like certain Caribbean islands and then just a huge slave population. There wasn't a lot of mixing. Mm. That's that's good. And and see, the, the reason why I was asking that is because I really want to understand, you know, the strength of women and particularly uh, black women, because they were a part of the building of America mm -hmm. at that foundational level. And I'm looking at today and I know like, you know, I hear women talking about being tired from driving the kids to school, you know, and coming back and doing laundry and washing the dishes. And so when you think we're still humans, so I'm like, man, there was that these women as a human, not as a robot, were up at the crack of dawn. And if breakfast was a thing, had to cook breakfast for her family feed her husband, feed her kids, and then go out and hold the field or and pick cotton or do whatever, and then come in and try to bathe in the, you know, basin or wherever, make dinner. And then after doing manual labor out in the hot sun, then have a man climb on top of her to... Yeah be impregnated and then sometimes that man be the master the master's son the master's brother and all, or also her husband or a man she could have been cheating with that's on the plantation so um, when i look at just the the full day the full life of a woman at that time i'm like man that's that's a heavy burden to to carry because I know just being a married man, it's a lot of days my wife got a headache and she did not have to hold a field. It's a lot of days she is dead tired and she did not have to do any work in the sun. So I'm like, it's almost like they weren't human. Like you said, they had like, what'd you call it? The, the beast, the burden beast of burden, burden. beast, of, beast burden. of burden. Yeah. Yeah. So how does that, where it originated with black women in America. How do we see that today? Like that, that strength, like how do you believe it was passed down the strength or the culture or some of the things we see today? Like, do you believe there's a correlation with black women today being the number one college degree holders? I believe I read something that black women are receiving college degrees at a higher rate than any other demographic and I believe I something in 2021 is black women became entrepreneurs higher than any other demographic do you believe there's a correlation of that strength that was born in the beginning that correlates to today absolutely man one of the stereotypes that I would say is positive about black women is how just damn strong they are like not just physically but like spiritually and emotionally whenever you know you think of like a black woman right they always you know have them like humming some sort of a gospel tune and if you think about the communities at church you know i mean i haven't been to a black church in years i think last time i went was with you but like you know like it's predominantly like the women right and because that's where they look like the one solace they could find was that all of this life is burden and we're gonna find a better way you know afterwards uh, in New Orleans, the one of the things they do after a funeral is they play um, uh, I'll fly away, oh glory. Like if you listen to the word of one glad morning when this life is over, it's a glad morning when this life is over, I'm going to fly away, right? And all the songs are like, 
I'm going to leave. It's going to be great. That's why they celebrate. Like in New Orleans, they play the sad song on the way to the funeral, right? And on the way back, they're happy. Their life of, of pain and labor is over. Now, that, that, that also comes into, you know, just general, like kind of a peasant setting of like hard work. But like Black women had it extra tough. So they had to be hard. I mean, what choice do you have? You're going to crumble? Like you can't, literally can't. And they're doing all of this, you know, I mean, we, we sit here modern day and talk about it, but they're doing all this with like out air conditioning, you know, like they got to work hard all day. They come in, there's no like easy chair. Let me rest my feet. No, it's hot. It's dirty. It's nasty. Talk about bathing. They don't bathe every day. Sorry about that. They, they don't, they don't bathe every day. Most white people didn't either. It wasn't something you did all the time. Like everyone just kind of just, it's just nasty, man, and dirty and horrible. And now you got somebody that's out there and they want to do something and you don't want to do it, but you can't really say no. And it, man, it's, it's hard, but I do think that they see a way out. When slavery ends, they see a way out through education. And you get a woman like, like Fanny Barrier Williams, who is just an amazing person. And she, you know, started a bunch of organizations. She was helped start the NAACP. And a lot of the early, like, Black pioneers, are, you know, are, are like women in education. Um, you know, Bethune from Bethune Cookman College here in Florida, uh, you know, one of them, right? So they think, look, man, you know, I'd rather do mental labor and learn and teach people rather than do this field work, right? So, you know, modern day, we have like people from other countries come and do our field work. It's because as soon as people could stop, they would because it was hard labor, right? So, I mean, like today, the strength of them comes from kind of their ability to, I mean, you know, put up with shit, man. I mean, like, you know, like to put up with it, like they don't want to, they're going to complain the way through it, but you know what I mean? But like, they do it. They don't quit. There's a lot of different cultures in the world that will quit. They'll find another way to do it or they will just stop. But no, like black women will, 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 they'll do the job and they'll bear it. And then they keep on. They're, they're strong. I mean, that's what, that's something that they, that's definitely been passed down is because, you know, that strength, that being able to, to deal with the situation and to try to change it if you can, but Hey, there's no use in planning right now. Like, just get your job done and do it, you know, and you got to deal with the family. I mean, if you look at like a modern woman, you know, they, they have to deal with so many things, right? And they don't have the, the physical labor, a lot of mental stress, a lot of those things. They have to deal with so many things and they don't have an option to say no. When you have a child, right, and the man's gone or whatever, you know, even today, a man's gone. You can't just no, Like, you know, like that's your kid. You were the one. You got the breast milk. You have to feed the child. You have, you have this burden on you. That's, that's, you know, women throughout history. Let me ask you a question, Chuck. And um, you still got a little time? Oh, of course, man. My audience used to like one hour long videos. We had 33 minutes. And I know they're mad that we missed that 30 seconds in the beginning. And I'm going to have them put comments, you know, in the comment section of other questions they have for you as a historian. Because everybody does their own research and their own history. So everybody thinks they know history. But it's good to kind of bounce off different you know, stories or different facts. But I want to ask you this off, you know, the beaten path, but <laughs> you're a white, you're a white man. And I've been hearing Last time this I term. <laughs> you, you, you're a white man. And I've been hearing this term from black women called divesting. And what they're talking about is really like giving up on the black man because of how black men treat them, which I believe it's a lot of trauma that black men have just from history and going to, in a lot of cases, white men and believing, you know, and white men treating them better in, in modern times. As a white man, you know, what do you think about that? Like, how do white men view black women? Um, just generally speaking, you can't speak for every white man. And you know, what's the real on that? And do you, and, and if a white man treats a black woman better, why would that be? All right. Uh, okay. All right. So you do have pieces of trash white guys, right? That beat their wives, you know, alcoholics and all that stuff. They exist for everybody. Okay. We have certain stereotypes within the white community about which type of white people are better. I'm not going to name the different kinds of white people because you know, we all know like, okay, there's like jokes about, okay, this kind of white guy beats his wife and drinks and this kind, you know, is basically like, you know, uh, whipped, you know, like certain, certain cultures, like, they'll just say positively, the French, right? 
you know, they're always talking about romance and love and then, you know, take your coat off and put it on a puddle and let the woman through, right? And you worship the woman, right? It's this idea of courtly love. And that, I mean, that spreads down. That's through propaganda, through cartoons, you know, Disney and all that, about how to treat a woman, you know, you want to put her on a pedestal, you want to make her feel like a princess, right? You know, those kinds of things. Um, Because you're supposed to be the knight in shining armor. All of this stuff comes from like tales. Uh, As far as like divesting, um, (laughs) what I would say is just pick somebody you like. It doesn't really matter. Like, look at the person, right? I've got white friends that are are men that have married black women, right? Completely fine. I've got the reverse. I got black men that are married white women. And I've got, you know, you, you married black woman. So like, I don't, I wouldn't say, you know, just go after the, the white man because you're going to, I mean, like, if you're just going for a guy, you don't know what you're going to get. What I would say is, honestly, pick somebody that looks like they treat you well, but not just you, how they treat other people, because that's really more important, right? I love my wife. I treat her well. I treat my friends well. I treat other people well, right? But it has nothing to do with necessarily that, you know, my skin color is white. Now, I was brought up in a world where, like, you will get married, right? And you won't leave your wife. You know, divorce is not a good thing. Divorce is quitting, right? Some people just aren't made to be together. But it's like, you should really find somebody that you love. Okay, I told my wife the third day I knew her. I said, I love you. We're going to get married. And we're going to have children. And she didn't think I was crazy, which means she's crazy. And this is why we worked out for the last, you know, 12 years. But, uh, but we have been taught by our moms that... You treat a girl correctly, right? Like when you go out on a date, you do those things that modern culture seems to say is lame, right? Like you pussy whip, like, oh, you a beta. Um, Those kinds of things that like, okay, you can't do this. Like you got to be, you know, a super player. And I'm not saying that I didn't have my time, you know, when I was in college and being a jerk, but but you you quickly realize that's that you're treating, you're mistreating human beings, okay? First and foremost, this is a human being you're dealing with, right? So you, as a white man, we're, I mean, I don't really know how black people are taught any different because I didn't grow up in your house, but, you know, I was always taught you treat, you know, a woman like, well, not just women, but, you know, you treat somebody that you love that, that you, you know, they are above all of us, right? You should put down whatever it is for them. You should make grand gestures. And I don't know if your people know us, um, but we, we've been friends since high school. And I know, you know, and I know you remember my my senior year when I had a girlfriend, and I might have put somebody too much on a pedestal, right? But like, you want to do those romantic gestures. Um, I'm not going to advocate, hey, go ahead and date a white dude because we're going to give you flowers all the time and make you feel like whatever. Because uh, maybe not all of us will do that. But uh, I, you know, what I would say is, if, if they are feeling like black men are not treating them correctly, they need to not deal with the ones that are now. But when they have sons. You have got to teach them how to treat a woman. You cannot let them go out and be a player and do all this stuff. You have got to teach them how to treat a woman. There's a song um, where, uh, you know, and and same thing with daughters, right? You have to teach a woman self-respect. Like I have a daughter, I'm teaching her. You must find a man that loves you and treats you right. Do not let them mistreat you in any way, okay? So I think that that somewhere, I don't know where, I mean, as a historian, I, I could probably look into that. But somewhere we went away from that. Uh, since the 1970s, divorce has skyrocketed. So this idea that every relationship is kind of tenuous, every relationship is kind of, um, you know, uh, like, you know, it, it, it could be temporary. Uh, we're here for there. People aren't looking for love so much anymore as they're looking for status of a relationship. Like, hey, I got this person. I got this thing. I am valued this much. This person values me this much. You know, look at my ring, right? Like that kind of stuff. And uh, you know, I, I would say that, I mean, there's different kinds of white people. So, you know, an Italian is different than an Irishman, which is different than an American who's mixed of everything, you know? So like everybody's kind of got a different culture. Like Italians, I know sometimes can be fiery and they might, you might see two Italian people arguing, and, but they love each other. And they'll might be like, oh, you're stupid. No, you're stupid. And you're like, how are you living like this? But to them, that's how they communicate. That's their culture, Right. And then other cultures you might see where they're like, yes, okay, anything you say, blah, blah, blah. And they look like they're kind of whipped, but at the same time, they're just going to go right back, go to the bar, go to the gambling, you know, place and do all that and not listen to their wives. I mean, I would just say, like, if you're not going to browbeat 
adult men into changing who they are. Unfortunately, we are stuck the way they are. But what you can do is help the future generations by, you know, just emphasizing how you should treat a woman. I mean, really, you know, like the, the crumbling of like the family is really kind of part of it because when you see like your mom and dad together and they love each other, then you kind of get like, oh, like that's how it should be. And if you're in a relationship and it's not like your mom and dad, you know, this isn't kind of what I was used to. But, you know, people who parents have bad relationships tend to have bad relationships. And I mean, that's nothing new. So I, I just, I, I would just encourage everybody to just look at the person who you're talking to. I mean, because when you're dealing with white people, you got to deal with a lot of stuff too. We got a lot of different cultural hangups. You know, there's a lot of issues, obviously, between white people, white people, we got to work out. And so, you know, like I had black girlfriends and, you know, I'm, you know, real cool with black people, but it's different when you date me, right? Like now, now, now you got to live up to certain expectations of what I want, right? And, you know, like sometimes it's like, look, you, we, we both can't get our way, that type of thing. And I'm not going to leave, but I'm going to, you know, try to get you to see my way. And, you know, it, it, it's individuals, man. That's really what it comes down to. Right. And that was my point, too, because I think there there was this feeling and there, there's this, you know, groundswell of this feeling, this thought that if you're a black woman and you go to a white man, you're automatically going to be treated better and you're going to be happier and like you're going to be like this, this princess on a pedestal, this savior. And what I was trying to, you know, what you said, it has to really be genuine it has to be an organic like a real connection and not just like hey i'm choosing this race because they are seen as a higher race a better race because i would imagine that in some black women going to a white man if it's the wrong white man it could become that slave slave owner slave mentality like hey i'm a prize you know treat me like a prize and that could be a real thing. And then sometimes I, I could also see where a white man could see a black woman and be like, I appreciate and love and adore your strength and what you've overcome. And I respect that. And whereas, like you said, when you see your mom and dad and their relationship, and if they work, you want that. And you're like, okay, this is what a relationship is like. But it's so many black men that didn't see a two parent home. And right. so they get into a relationship and they don't really know how to be in a two parent home, like how to make a relationship work because they didn't see it. And so I wanted I wanted your opinion on that, you know, and, and you know, it just as a white man, just to see if you amongst white men, if y'all are just inherently better lovers than black men, you know. <laughs> well, what I would say is this uh, European culture tends to put a lot of like, if you look at our stories, right? If you were to take, because you I mean, you can go to Africa and you can get the griots and you can get their stories about that. A lot of European stories revolve around love. King Arthur, right? He has a beautiful wife, Guinevere, who cheats on him with his best knight, Lancelot. And people are like, oh, and there's songs about that. Green Sleeves is about, you know, unrequited love. And it's all about love, 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 love. And that's put on a pedestal from just that cultural, you know, representation. So that, that takes place in our society. Um, other societies value different things, right? You know, so um, what I would say is one interesting fact that, I, that I've that i kind of known for a while is that the statistically two most, when I say loneliest, but it's the people that are not married as much, you know, or have partners on the planet are Asian men and black women, right? As far as being single. So statistically, if you want to tell them to go find an Asian man, he will love you and whatever, if you, you know, you know what I'm saying? So he will shower you with gifts and everything, right? But that's because, you know, there's a lot of Asian women that, that you know, are desired by, you know, what they always call Asians, right? And so they're always like, they look at some Asian girl. Nellie had a line, like, looking for a girl half Black and Asian, right? And it's like, so, you know, like, there's these things that are desired. Uh, but I wouldn't say, you know, just a white man's going to solve your problems. Um, but, but as far as our culture, like it, we do have it. Here's one thing I, I've noticed, right? And I was actually talking about our, our friend Pop the other day about this. The R&B songs we used to hear growing up, there's not so many anymore, right? Remember, like we used to listen to like, no, no, don't leave, don't leave me, girl. Like all of these songs. And it was okay to have feelings. I remember in the 80s, all these songs, Black men singing about, I love you, don't leave me. These songs are gone. Now it's all like, 
you know, going to the club or it's some like super emo rap stuff where they're like, I can't trust nobody, you know, you know, like, like all this stuff. It's like, where was that? Like, when will it be cool again to like Lionel Richie style sing to a girl? When is boys to men going to be cool? You know what I'm saying? Any of us who grew up kind of in the 90s or older people than us, you know, like there's no more boys to men anymore. It's looked as lame, right? Because now, oh man, you're in your feelings about a girl. Like somehow, like, look, I'm not, I'm definitely not one of these people that's like super liberal, you know, kind of thing. But I'm like not saying over, but we've gotten way over masculinized to the point where as a man, you're not supposed to be able to, to, to have a woman grab your heart. Man, that used to be cool. Used to, you listen to blues songs. They're talking about my woman left me and they love it. You could feel their heartache. Is that something we all got? Not everybody needs a gun and drugs. And I think that culturally we're kind of in a, in a spiral because Nobody wants to correct it. It's, it's, it's the, the, you know, the cool, tough guys have run amok. And I think that if you can get back to those days, you might see, you, you might see a return to where, you know, if they're having a problem with black men, that they're able to express their love again, right? Because now you got to do it in text messages with smiley faces so no one can know and no one can see. Long gone are the days, you know, where like, you know, Smokey Robinson is singing or the Temptations are singing, you know, I heard it through the grapevine and all that. Like, like if you listen to the music, if you just want to know how culture is, just listen to the music, okay? Start off with as much old as you can, listen to the words and what they're singing about, and watch it change over time. Because music will tell you about a culture more than anything. So just listen to it, man. And that's all I got to say. <laughs> hey, that's powerful. That's powerful, Chuck. Man, I got a feeling that my audience is going to want to have you back. So any questions they have Hopefully. that they, they want to hear, you know, from a historian, They'll put it in the comments, and um, that's amazing. And you said a mouthful about that music, and so we'll we'll do some um, we'll do a talk about the history of music, and the different and how it impacts culture and just the time. So, hey, I really appreciate you, Chuck. And so we'll from here we'll let the audience throw out some questions, and I'll screenshot and text them to you, and you can check this video out. I'm, I think I'm going to post it today at some point, maybe around 4 p.m. ish if, if I can get it uploaded. And y'all right. forgive me for the glitch in here. At the beginning, I was trying to switch my Wi-Fi or something, but we'll we'll recap that too. But thank you so much, Chuck, for your time. And I look oh, forward to having another conversation with you. Absolutely, man. See you, dude. Awesome. Let me stop that.